I am Reed Price. I'm the director of the Senior Community Center, and I am happy to welcome you all here again today for something to talk about. And our guest today is Rebecca Rockefeller, who is one of the co-founders of something we kind of take for granted just because it seems like such a home-baked thing, buy nothing. And it did start on Bainbridge Island, but it grew to be much more than that. And so I asked uh, Rebecca if she would come by and talk about how uh, she and her colleague uh, came up with the idea of buy nothing, how it's going, and uh, things that we've learned, and of course, ways that it's changed. So thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the so, invitation. So uh, why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about how the idea, which sounds a little like uh, uh, zero waste, uh, the idea of not wasting, not wanting, uh, got started with you and Liesl. So Liesl and I are um, very good friends. We met here on the island when our children were all enrolled in the Mosaic Home Education Partnership at Commodore on the island. And we um, did a lot of things together. So we were basically homeschooling our young kids. And one day Liesl and her kids went to Point No Point for a walk. And Liesl called me from the car on her phone and said, you have got to get your beach clothes ready. We're going back out here tomorrow. You have to see what we found. So we went out there with them and they um, showed us all of the marine plastics that were in the rack line on the beach. And they, um, <clears throat> at first glance, didn't appear to be there. And because we had kids who were down on the ground a lot digging around, the kids found them and brought our attention to it. And we that set us off on a journey that this was, gosh, my kid is now, my daughter is a senior in high school and this happened when she was in first grade. So we've been working at it this long, that long, um, sort of the extent of our, my daughter's childhood. Um, and it, we, in the beginning, started monitoring the plastics that were here in in our environment on the island. So we did a couple of years where we, with our children, went out to the beaches and did surveys. We had a giant spreadsheet. We were keeping track of the number of pieces of plastics and the kinds of plastics that we were finding. Um, and we did a bunch of research with our kids as a homeschool project looking into where those plastics come from. And it's a really common conception um, to blame environmental waste things like marine plastic on other people like oh that came from those other people over there that fell off a barge or that came from a ship or people across the ocean and what we know is that actually more than 80 percent of it comes from right where you find it near shore activities or watershed activities and so that made us start tracking plastic waste on Bainbridge Island up through our watersheds so we would find for instance these really distinctive shards of plastic on the beach they're particular shade of blue which um but they were that looked like a pen like a ballpoint pen a really common ballpoint pen that we've all seen everywhere um, and we couldn't figure out how they were ending up on our island beaches in these very sharp shards because we don't have that sort of wave action here that would pummel a piece of plastic and break it down um, and we knew from everything that we were reading from scientists that it was probably from the island so we started tracking literally like finding the shards we could find them on the beach we could find them um, across the street from the beach we could find them in parking lots and then one day i followed um, a garbage truck around actually and watched as some a pen fell out of it because it was a small item and it ended up underneath another car's wheel and was smashed and it broke into these very distinctive shards of plastic. So for me, that was a big aha moment where I was literally like, started off at the beach and I traced the path of this very common marine plastic item to the Safeway parking lot where I shop and where I drive my car. And I realized like, this is, truly from all of us this waste that is around us it, it's not from other people that's from us and it's not because we are um purposely littering the environment we have designed these systems where we have um <clears throat> we just can't possibly keep track of all of it we have a lot of mass-produced items they fit in our pockets they fall out of our pockets i mean this is just small stuff but it scales up to every sort of object that we have we're swimming and stuff so Liesl and i 
turned our attention away from actually documenting the plastics and to trying to figure out how to get people, how to address it at a more fundamental level. Like we know that we have this massive problem of waste and we want to get closer to zero waste. So how do we do that? How do we inspire ourselves and our communities to live a more zero waste lifestyle. So we worked on that. We ran waste audits in the public schools. We ran waste audits for businesses. Like anyone who would let us come and go through their garbage with them, we would do that. We um, helped at the Rotary Auction to develop what they call the loo, which is the lawn of opportunity. So that instead of automatically dumpstering things that the Rotary Auction knows they cannot sell, they were finding ways to find like community farmers in the community who could use things that the Rotary Auction couldn't sell or artists and craftspeople and all sorts of different nonprofits. Um, and so we were able to help them reduce their waste. And, and then we worked on an app with Scott James, who's also on the island, and Terry Bellamy, who's another islander, on an app called Trash Backwards, where we took um, we created a database of reuse solutions. So you could basically go into this app and type in, I have um, a lawn chair and I want to turn it into something, a broken lawn chair. So we would have all of these different reuse options that you could, things you could turn your broken lawn chair into or ways that you could, you know, turn, find another life for it. Um, and that, in the process of all of this, we on a daily basis are just engaged in this ongoing conversation about how to shift our daily activities so that we are living a more zero waste life from the beginning. Like, how do I get to a point where I don't have a lot of broken crap that I need to re figure out how to deal with it? How do I, how do I reduce the amount of stuff that's coming into my life? But how do I do that in a way that is sustainable? And what we feel really strongly about, based on all sorts of experiments that we ran on our own families, is that the only way to make, or the best way we think to make this this shift is to find joy in it. That um, a lot of our environmentalism in this country has been really based on this sort of um, asceticism, this idea that you should like put on your hair shirt of righteousness and suffer for the environment. Like you should deny yourself these things and you should be a super minimalist. And we don't think that that works for everybody. It doesn't work for people with small kids. It doesn't work for um, a lot of us. It also doesn't have a lot of joy in it. And the way to really compel change, lasting behavioral change, is to make it better. Like to offer somebody something that isn't based on abnegation and, and denial, but based on joy. And so we thought, what is it that which led us to this question, which is, why do we have all this stuff? Why do we each in our homes have all of these things that we don't use all that often? Why do we feel the need to get a new sweater instead of just wearing the old one? And it comes down to, it's a lot of, um, a lot of different things, but one of the things it is, is that those are, that's how our society tells us we should measure our worth that we are, we've made it if we have, you know, this brand new thing and that brand new thing and we don't have a patch on our jeans and we don't reuse things, we don't sh ask our neighbor for their old stuff, we don't offer it up because we have this concept in our mind, it's a very sort of um, American model of charity in which if you're wealthy, you give things away. And if you're financially poor, you take things, you receive things from, you know, richer people, wealthier people. And it's a it's a power dynamic that's very inequitable. And it's one that in which people base their sense of self-worth on the amount of stuff that they own and also the fact that they can, they have, they can give it away. And what we wanted was to offer um, a different, to get at the root of our relationship with our stuff and our I, the way that we identify ourselves in relationship to stuff and also the way that we um, identify ourselves as members of a community. And while we were having all these ongoing conversations, Liesl and her family were spending about six months a year in Nepal. Um, they, her husband is a high alpine, high um, Himalayan mountaineer, and Liesl is a filmmaker, and they were working on um, a film about a civilization that they had helped to um, access uh, sort of um, archaeological remnants and skeletal remnants of this previously unknown civilization in these caves. 
Caves and the Missing Valley in Nepal. And um, so they're off traveling and learn a lot about traditional, um, the sort of discovering this old, this ancient culture that nobody even knew what to call it, didn't know who these people had been, um, and spending time with their Nepali friends in a small village in Nusbaan, which is very um, off the grid. There was, until recently, not even a road that you could take to get there. You sort of, you would travel by yak and um, to get there. And so that's a very traditional economy um, where people didn't have a lot of outside resources coming in they needed to make do with what they had there. At the same time, I'm here on Bainbridge and I was a freshly um, single mother with two kids, both had special needs and was not able to um, work for a living. So I had to, I went to Healthline House. It was a client at Healthline and needed to, um, they helped me get food stamps for my kids. I was basically living a life that I hadn't imagined would be mine that was um, in which I suddenly was on the flip side of what I had always known. I was always, I grew up donating to Helpline and suddenly I was the person going to Helpline and getting food. Um, and the, the, my experience of that, of being that person who needed help from my community and had to go through this whole process all the time on the phone to be recertified as like an appropriately poor person to ask for help was so demeaning and so dehumanizing. And I, it, um, it was corrosive on, in terms of how I viewed myself and, and um, my worth in my community. So while Weasel's off in Nepal, she had this amazing experience where they had brought clothing with them to give to the families there. And Weasel had, and her kids had divided it. So they had kids' clothes and they had, you know, all the different adult-sized clothing and then they had, um, you know, different sort of outerwear, whatever. They had divided it and they, they were going to give the kids' clothing to the families with kids and the, you know, the adult clothing would go to adults. This is Weasel's mind of how you would equitably distribute clothing. And so she brought these giant duffel bags of clothing up there and unzipped them and all of her friends in the village were like, no, 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 that's not how we do things here. We actually need, everyone gets a little bit of everything. So that people who don't have kids have something they can give to the families that do have kids and this person who doesn't need an adult male extra large shirt can give it to this guy who does need it because it's actually in that giving is how our village survives. It's the being and receiving from each other on an equal plane. We all need to be um, givers and we all need to receive and it has to it has to happen or our village won't survive. So that was Weasel's big aha moment and she came home and told me that and we thought this is that's what's missing. Like that's what, one of the reasons I feel so horrible about myself is that right now I'm in a position where I'm being told I'm only worth receiving, I have to take that I, and, and I'm kind of a looked on, I hear people talking about mothers like me, single moms as like, you know, leeches on society and how I shouldn't be allowed to have, you know, a, a glass of wine or a candy bar. It's like, you know, I should basically be penitent all the time and sort of groveling. And, um, Sounds it, a little bit like environmentalism. Huh? Together, sort of. <laughs> Sounds a yeah, little bit right? like environmentalism. So we, we put those two Totally. So we put those two things together, sort of what I was learning from my experience and what she had learned from hers, and we decided this is what we need. We need to start a gift economy. So we started one called Bainbridge Barter that met every Saturday at Waterfront Park, and we just invited people to bring whatever they had from their gardens or their kitchens. It was like it was kind of constrained in the first iteration, and we said, just come, and we're just going to lay this all out on the park tables, um, and anyone who anyone can have whatever they want and there's no there will be actually we called it Bainbridge barter but there was no bartering it was basically like a free potluck so I would bring greens that I had foraged in um, the watershed like the little park near me and Lisa brought eggs from her chickens and I had like extra lettuce for my garden and other people brought bread that they baked and all sorts of jams and whatever and we would just lay it all out on this table everybody would talk a little bit about what they brought and then everybody would just help themselves and it was this like transformational experience because we all came 
away from that feeling like we had gotten the better end of the deal. Like every single person leaving the table would say, I can't believe, like, I think this isn't fair. <laughs> like I now have this whole bag or this basket full of like beautiful things, flowers and food that I, that, and, and I, and I'm worried that everyone else that I took too much. And we would all realize like, actually, no, there's truly enough here for all of us. Like there's this amazing, when we pitch in the little bits that we have extra of, and we don't worry about tracking who gave what and who took and how much and tit for tat kind of stuff. When we don't barter, when we just look at it as if we are truly what we are, which is one human family. We're one family around this table and everybody gets their needs met and we're gonna make it work. And it was this amazing experience. So we did that and then we ran into the reality of the fact that we live on Bainbridge Island and the weather here nine months out of the year is not really great for meeting up at the park and, and trading things. So it was like, we got sort of rained out and cold <laughs> and during the winter months we were really missing it and so, we realized we could transfer this to a Facebook group experience and open it up to the whole island, which is what we did. So the first Buy Nothing project group was right here on Bainbridge and events we had within, I think we said it, it was just about, just over seven years ago that we did it. And within the first hour, we had like 300 members. And the next day we were at a thousand. And then pretty soon we had 5,000 people in there, which is a pretty significant proportion, portion of our, you know, 20,000 at that point um, yeah. island population. So <laughs> that was, that was, that's a <laughs> really long version of where it all came from. <laughs> that's a wonderful, wonderful story of how one thing kind of leads into another and you actually uh, sort of, uh, touched a nerve, and I think that idea of um, of being both a giver and a receiver gives us um, the benefits of sort of paying into the culture that uh, you know our, our instincts, which it sounds like is not based on uh, on the story from Nepal, uh, not a not a, an American only feeling of like acquiring and giving as being part of the same process. Right, and that's, I mean, that's what we found. I think we've, ta I think it's really, we're trained, this, my politics will show through here a little bit. We're trained, I think, by capitalism to think of ourselves as participants in this very sort of, um, you know, bloodthirsty, unkind world in which everyone is just out for themselves and we all need to be on guard and we need to sort of keep our things close and be careful about who we trust. And I don't actually believe that that's our most fundamental innate human nature. We are a social species and we are literally wired to care for each other. We are wired to see that there is a greater good and that we need to be participants in this greater good and, and that that's actually our best um, in safety network that is, is, a, is a strong community. And that I, I think that we innately want to care for each other. We want to trust each other. And um, what we do in the Buy Nothing Project is provide people a chance. I mean, it's not, it, people join it because they get free stuff, but the real lesson that we're offering, the real gift that we want to give people is a chance to shift from that scarcity mindset, that isolated, I need, I'm all on my own, I'm out here, this is a cruel world mindset to one of, I'm part of a community, I know people, they know me, we have, we've given and received from each other, we have relationships, we have networks of connection, and I am not alone. And there is actually great abundance when we view what we own as a collectively held resource that we're willing to share. And that when we do that, when we're, if we can start to see that as a, a behavior that we should celebrate and laudable and um, we start to elevate people who do that instead of elevating people who buy all the new things and keep them for themselves, then we've made this, we've helped society shift into a more sustainable way of living on the planet in which we are more in line with the, the, the fundamental truth is, yes, we are on a planet with limited resources. We can figure out how to 
this together, we're not going to make it. it the, the, you know, period. <laughs> yep. So it does seem like uh, that ap that appetite is there. You were touching with just the happenstance of working one step to another into something that immediately resonated with people, not only on Bainbridge, but tell us a little bit about how uh, it grew off island and continues to grow. Right. So I, it was really fascinating to see. So we had the Bainbridge group, which quickly became much too big to manage. We've learned a lot about human behavior in large groups, and we've learned what a good group size is. So we, we at the same time that the Bainbridge run was just exploding, we had a good friend who has a, a mother on Bainbridge. She said, oh, I want one of these from my neighborhood in Seattle. And then we set one up for um, North Kitsap. And then we had Liesl's parents who live outside of Boston who set one up for their neighborhood. And then it was just this word of mouth thing. So we ended up um, it literally having to create a whole structure. It's an entire volunteer structure. None of us are paid. It's a completely non-monetized um, movement or network. Um, so we went from that initial group on Bainbridge to now we are about seven and a half years into this, not even seven and a half, just over seven. And the last time we counted, we had 1.5 million participants around the world in about 30 countries and about 7,000 volunteers. And that actually, those numbers will be larger now because literally every day we have dozens of people reaching out and getting in touch with volunteers who help them set up new buy nothing groups in their countries and their cities. And it's it just, it's, and I think it's because we tapped into that innate desire that we each have to live a life of meaning and to have that meaning defined by our connections with other people and not what we own, not our stuff. We want something deeper and we want to, we, we do want to share with each other. And are you distributing, it sounds like you've distributed the knowledge of how to do this so that it's not all centralized. It's a decentralized. Uh, right, that's exactly. So can you talk a little bit about how, exactly. you, how you made that transition yes. from everything being yeah, here? So <laughs> yeah, so we actually, so we initially started with a model in which we, um, base, everything is based on, was based on Facebook, and we trained teams of volunteers to help us, and they would help us then set up um, other groups. So we would have these, like, one woman um, that we met in California was like, I want to set this up in California, and she did her own group, and then she became the person, the sort of the point person for California, who would help everybody else in California set up groups. So doing it that way, we sort of started this sort of regional map of um, people, and then we would all talk to each other in a separate Facebook group and organize things, and it... Um, became overwhelming really quickly. So a lot of, it's if you're just a volunteer and in your spare time, you're trying to manage a social movement that involves the daily participation of over a million people, it's a little bit too much for any single person to do. So we realized we needed to, our real goal here is to empower people to make these changes for themselves and empower people to give them access to these ideas and then see what else they can do with it. Like, what other kinds of iterations of gift economy thinking can there be? How can we combine um, the basic idea of a gift economy, say, with ideas of racial justice or reparations or environmental justice or, or um, all sorts of different accessibility issues for marginalized communities? How can we address, how can we use this really powerful way of connecting to address and start to undo the damage or repair the damage of some of these other, you know, major injustices. Um, and so in order to facilitate that, we've been really steadily working for the past almost three years now to do exactly to what you said, which is decentralized, to take our voices out of the center. We've turned all of our foundational documents that you need to sort of set up one of these groups, the sort of the structural support, into documents that have a public copyright. So people can access these documents and they can make edits to them. They can, it's basically their own copy of the document. And as long as they're not using it for commercial purpose, they can set up their own kind of group. They can change what doesn't work for them. They can add things. Um, and we are working now to take that even one step. For, we're just constantly peeling away. It's like, where is there a hierarchy that we can uh, dismantle? <laughs> so we're, we're sort of chipping away, trying to remove um, all of the 
hierarchical power structures within the movement so that it is truly just everyone accesses these resources and Liesl and I can act as librarians and say, oh yes, we know exactly that you write, you've asked us a question about this problem your group is having, we'll write this, you know, little sort of article about it and we will post it publicly so that anyone can find the answer, you know, based on our experience and also other people who have other answers can offer, you know, their articles and we'll post those too. So we're really, that's our project for this year and this next year is to move completely to just a very flat structure. So if I'm interested in following your thinking and that kind of activity, is the uh, buynothingproject.org a good place to uh, to connect or get that yep. information? That is absolutely perfect. Yep, that's perfect. And we also were really fortunate to um, publish a book with Simon and Schuster this past year. So we have all of this out in book form as well. And um, I am pretty confident that the Kitsap Regional Library has at least one copy of it that people can check out. And I know it's at Eagle Harbor Books as well. Um, but yes, that's our goal is basically we put everything we put into the book. So it's basically a primer that people can pick up and access all of our thinking about this and, um, it, you know, and how to do all of these things do not need to be done on social media. Social media is fine for some things. I think we all know how um, corrosive and damaging and threatening it is to our democracy. So we're really trying to provide people tools to move this elsewhere, wherever they need it. Um, well, so yeah, it is interesting. We're learning. The best yeah, places. yeah, we're learning a little bit about how uh, some things that seem to have good intentions uh, don't always play out the way that we might have imagined. Social media being definitely uh, one of those things. A hundred. Yes. So true. Uh, so one of the challenges with COVID has been obviously a rollback of a lot of the reuse and return. And we're seeing uh, some anxiety about uh, shared materials and obviously oh, yeah. uh, in around the country we've seen a lot of uh, of return to single package items and that kind of thing. That must be a bit of a challenge as you're trying to move us in this new direction. It is and I think it um, I, I, the most important thing for me and for Liesl that we really are trying to share one of the things is that the less dogmatic our thinking, the better in general. So when it applied to this, um, that looks like I, I don't love single use plastics, obviously. I've just spent the past like decade plus of my life working really hard to get rid of them and help us not use them. But I love human life even more than I hate single use plastics. And so it makes perfect sense to me that right now we have moved to, um, you know, uh, in plastic gloves, um, disposable masks. If that's what it takes to save people's lives, then I am 100% fine with it. And there are so many other places where there are what we call stupid plastics and stupid items, the things that really we don't need, that there's, there's plenty of work for us to do. We don't need to get caught up on feeling bad about the fact that we're in the midst of this global pandemic and now there's a lot of plastic waste. Yes, it is bad. It's bad. This is a global pandemic and it's horrid. And let's not beat ourselves up about what we need to do to keep ourselves and our communities safe. Let's do that. And then let's also focus on ways that, sorry, I know you can probably all hear my chickens. I'm outside. Oh, boy, boy, so, boy, boy, <laughs> boy howdy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. But, so this is part of that pandemic. My kids are inside doing remote school, so I've yeah. been out to the park, which means we all get to hear my chicken. So um, the, uh, I, you know, there are so many things that we can give safely to each other, which is what we really were asking people to focus on when they're in a in a in a city or a neighborhood where there's a high virus um, activity and people really do need to stay home more, we can be checking in with each other. We can be um, offering gifts of companionship and picking up prescriptions for, for people who are in higher risk categories. We can pick up groceries. I mean, those of us who can be safely or more safely out in the community can do that for people who can't be there as safely. Um, and there are, you know, we know more now about um, items like clothing and how to make it safe to, to transfer those between individuals. And yeah, so less um, chatting on porches and more just putting things in a box or bag and people pick it up. But that's okay. That's 
you know, right now, I think of all of these things as acts of love. And right now, our acts of love look different than they did before, but they're still acts of love. And we still, there's still so many of them that we can, you know, participate in. Great. Um, and if anybody has any questions, they can either open up their microphone or, like Jeanette did, post something in the chat. Jeanette is uh, winding us back a little bit. She's interested if you would be willing to speak more about how you were made to feel, as she puts it, terrible when getting the support you and your children needed. You might not want to talk specifically about that, but good to know if this is, if you've seen any changes in, in sort of <laughs> attitudes about that. Yes. So I will say that the people locally, no one here on the island made me feel bad about it. It was the process that I had to go through to get, um, to say, qualify for food stamps or SNAP, the SNAP program, um, and for um, health insurance for my children through the state. That is a demeaning process, and it still is a demeaning process for people who do that now. That has not changed, unfortunately. And um, this yeah, just is. It's a, it's a very demeaning process. You are met with suspicion in the people that you're speaking with. It's a very, um, the, it's like the questions are targeted to make you see where you failed, even though the failure isn't yours. It's like circumstantial, and you're sort of held to account for things that have happened to you, or it just, it's hard to articulate the specifics. It's just it's a, it's a system designed very much, I believe, on the the um, this sort of power dynamic that is worked into a lot of our country's thinking about people who have financial means and people who don't, and, and to equate that with character um, or worth or ability is a grave mistake, and yet that's sort of what our system is set up for. So when you find yourself in a position like I did, you, you come into the, every question, the way the questions are written, the tone of voice that people use is all very much one that makes you aware that your society views you as, you know, lesser. Yeah, there's and that kind you of should a, be lucky that you're getting a scrap, as opposed to we want to take care of you. <laughs> like we want your kids to be healthy, and we want to help you make it happen. <laughs> right, and sort of a level of suspicion almost that somehow you're going to take advantage, as though that would be something oh, that yeah. people would choose to do. Yes. Right, exactly. No, it's very much so. And I would think, like, who would ever choose to go through this process? Who would, who would choose to call and spend literally an hour on hold and then another hour having, you know, where you're asking me, like, how old is my car? And am I, you know, do I have any money hidden in a sock somewhere? I mean, it sort of, it feels like that. And you're just like, oh, I just want some, like, I literally have hungry kids. I can't work because my kids' needs are such that I literally can't. And like, ah, <laughs> like, this is so awful. Just it's yeah, not fun. And so, and I yeah, and I can see that something like uh, the building of the community, the uh, Bainbridge Barter at the at the um, waterfront park here where we are, uh, kind of at least it, at least it was a an oasis or a window where where there was a community that was a little bit differently structured. Yes. Oh, oasis is a really great word. Yes, because I felt like there, no one was like are you at this potluck because you're a loser who couldn't get a job or it was just not how it was that's not what it was about it was like you're at this potluck because you want to be at this potluck <laughs> because you want to be part of this community like what do you we want everyone here and there were um weeks where people would come and they couldn't bring anything and we would all say great that means you can take more like that's good because <laughs> I have so much sorrel from my garden that I'm glad you have room in your basket because like it, it's it, it's um it was more yeah which is a very different oasis is the right word for it, it was like felt so good um, I don't know. You mentioned that there are some other things that have kind of grown out of this. Um, can you give us some sort of idea of things that have crossed your path as a result? I mean, I know the list must be huge, but uh, as a result of, of it is, what, do you mean sort of 
examples of other are, um, examples of other things so we that, have with it go ahead go ahead <laughs> Sorry, I know this Zoom is so much fun. Um, yeah, so the Buy Nothing project itself has spawned a whole bunch of different things. One of them is called um, Person to Person for Relief, which is a, we realized during um, every, we saw all these natural disasters happening in different communities. So the first one that the Buy Nothing Project Network was able to respond was the Otho landslide north of us. Um, up near Arlington and Barrington, and it, you know, I think most people probably remember it was a landslide that just disappeared a community in a matter of seconds and um, displaced a lot of the people who survived it, um, lost their homes, and, and everything they owned was covered in, you know, feet of mud. And their Buy Nothing project was no longer a group was no longer able to function because they didn't have computers to get online. They didn't have homes to store their stuff. They were just in like a Red Cross shelter. And the things that they were receiving from the Red Cross were really great in terms of like shelter, sort of Maslow's basic hierarchy. You know, they had shelter, they had food, they were safe and warm, but they didn't have the things that made them feel like they could breathe a little bit like they could um, re just feel less like refugees who were really unstable even so they were in this really unstable portion of their life and they were being you know they had clothes that were like the fit but it wasn't really what they wanted to wear or maybe the shoes were a half size too small or too big and we realized that we could actually our buy nothing project groups together and we could the people who were close to that air, the um that particular otho group could went in there on, on, with their, themselves and they got a list like mary wants a pink jacket for her five-year-old dark girl who loves unicorns this teenage boy would really like a um like a nintendo ds to play his games on and he wants a notebook that's blue and he would love a pair of black nikes so i mean we had a very specific list of what people wanted and we took those very specific requests and we put them out to buy nothing project groups locally and here on Bainbridge and we collected literally exactly what these people themselves asked for so they had some agency in this and we were able to drive load truckloads of stuff up and bring it to these people in O. So, and we realized from that that we could actually scale that up. So we, it was sort of a, a, a system of person-to-person -person disaster response where you really are delivering exactly what people want, where they want it, right when they need it. And we could do it all just as volunteers. And we, we um, started doing that in response to hurricanes and house fires and um, things like that in the U.S. and Canada. And then there was a de the devastating um, earthquake in Nepal some years ago. And that was our first sort of international person-to-person -person relief mission where we um, were able to collect tarps and stoves and clothing and medical supplies and we were able to get them um, on the ground to remote villages in Nepal before um, official relief organizations were able to do that because we weren't viewed as a relief organization. We had pilots who were volunteering their personal luggage allotments to fly things into um, Kathmandu and then they would, like a friend of ours, like someone we knew there would come in with his truck, pick it up from the airport, put it in the back of his truck <laughs> and just drive it up to the people who needed it. So we did this end run around all of the NGOs. None of our stuff was held up for tax at the airport. It was just individual items coming through in these duffel bags. And so we were able, and with on geo-tracking sort of um, cell phone stuff, we could literally watch these caravans of Jeeps that were loaded with goods that we had sent all the way going up into these, you know, little villages and helping people out. So that's a, that's a network that we've activated a number of times. And it's a separate thing, but it came out of the Buy Nothing Project. So that's one example. That's a that's a wonderful story, and I know that uh, that I have talked to people about the similar kind of response in Lesbos, where we had refugees coming uh, out of Europe, and the NGOs just are not designed uh, to handle uh, this kind of um, uh, what flexibility. And so, being able to have a person-to-person -person experience is wonderful. Yeah, it's that flexibility is the key thing that I think we get. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and um, so I just am uh, very grateful for you spending the time to share some of this with us. I know that uh, that that uh, there's a lot more here than I had any idea of, and I'm sure that's true for many of the uh, folks who are on the call as well. So uh, I know that uh, with all that's going on with you and your family, having time to join us is a, is a gift for us, so thank you. Oh, it was a gift for me to have a break from, you know, haranguing my children into doing their remote high school. So thank you all very much. <laughs>